Rahsan Bernard, welcome to Partnering Leadership. I'm thrilled to have you in this conversation with me. Oh, thank you so much, Mahan. This has been, I've been eagerly anticipating our time together. Rahsan, same here. I can't wait to talk about the incredible work you are doing with building bridges across the river. But before we get to that, would love to find out more about you and your upbringing. So whereabouts did you grow up, Rasan, and how did your upbringing impact the kind of person you've become? Yes, yeah, so Mahan, 90 miles south of Cuba is a wonderful oasis known as Jamaica. Um, and Jamaica has uh, 14 parishes that makes up the beautiful island. And I grew up uh, on the southwestern side of Jamaica in a parish called St. Catherine. Um, and that parish has a little city called Bridgeport. And um, I spent uh, 14 years of my life living in Bridgeport, St. Catherine. And it's been an unbelievable journey. And I'll share more about this unbelievable journey from Jamaica to America, um, from, from, you know, from a, a perspective of a little boy in Bridgeport now in the United States of America doing um, what I believe are some, uh, some really incredible things, so. Yeah, so 14 years of your upbringing, that's quite a bit of time that you spent in Jamaica. What sticks in your mind the most about those years uh, in Bridgeport before then coming here to the States? I would say the simplicity of living. I would say uh, the natural beauty of an island that many take for granted because they're there. I would say um, the calm and uh, levity of a people who, who are rich in culture and um, history. Uh, it's, it was a time when um, I was probably more free in my mind as it relates to uh, just conversations and aspirations and experiences. Uh, so, you know, we Jamaicans are known to have what we call an iry attitude, a really happy disposition. And I have to say that my childhood was was very happy. It was very much everything I just I just mentioned. So then what was the transition for you at 14? which is teenage years are hard anyway, Rasan. Yes. So yeah. what was that transition for you like to the States with your parents? You know, I, it's interesting because the transition by definition was opportunity. My mom and my father um, both sought opportunity here in the States and uh, really went after it. Uh, both were looking for jobs and got jobs on this side. Uh, of the country, um, of the world. Uh, and so for a 14 year old boy, it was, it, was, it was simultaneously exhilarating and terrifying because I left a cohort of friends who became really my foundation of relationships to a frontier where I not only was a foreigner, but had a, strength, a strong patois uh, in the way I spoke and, and in the way I, you know, I communicated that I, I just didn't know how it would connect with people here in the States. So then how were you able to make that work for you? You know, I think the genius of a young child or a teenager or a young person is just innovation, ingenuity, being adaptable, um, learning the context and mastering that context. I got into a place where I, I had a group of friends that I could model and emulate and learn the, the ins and outs of the context that I was in. Uh, I was in a school where presentations and workflows required communication often. And so tightening up on my English language or my non, you know, the patois became more, uh, less broken and more straightened, so to speak. And so over time, I think just reflexively building on those muscles that I mentioned to you before, you know, building new friendships, presenting more, communicating more, it, it really developed over time. And, and, and I remember almost like it was yesterday when it clicked, meaning when, when there was no longer this intentional, deliberate code switch to speak 
in a way that people could understand me without patois interfering with that communication. And um, at that point, I, I just think I, I was so I was so excited because I'd mastered that context, and and I could now go back and forth at my own behest. Before it was trying to straighten it out, and 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 there were interferences, but now I really mastered the communication. And so anyway, it was just a wonderful thing. And at the same time, I felt my relationships um, just really grew rapidly. And so I was involved with so many different people and communicating in so many different ways. It just it felt really natural. Yeah, and you have a natural talent at that building of those relationships. Some of it might have been what you got from your parents and from the culture. Some of it what you have learned through even the anti-fragility and the resilience that comes from having to fully adjust to a new environment at 14. So yeah. things are shifted for you, normal patterns are broken, but then you were able to uh, uh, be able to assimilate into the new environment. So I wonder, Rasan, if now you travel to LA or another part of the country and people ask you, where are you from? What do you say? You know, it's interesting. I, I reflexively say that I'm a Jamaican American. Um, I, I, it's, but, but, but that's a great question because if I'm in, if I'm in California, I, I would say I'm from DC. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's reflexive if I feel like the intention is really to get to know who I am and it's not just superficial talk. And I think that assessment of conversation, I think I, I, I'm pretty adept at with, you know, um, with assessing does someone really want to know me and really get to lean and lean in, or is this just a, a surface conversation that will end in in you know the 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 um, just you know easy back and forth banter. So yeah, so I would say reflexively, if I if you're leaning in to know me, I would say I was I'm a Jamaican who's an American and came here at 14 and would kind of lean in and go into that. But um, yeah, I think you know otherwise it's yeah I'm from D from the DC area <laughs> would be my my quick response. <laughs> And I bet as people get to know you, they would also ask you for great Jamaican cuisine and where they can find that. Oh, absolutely. I think every Jamaican, it is, it is, it is endemic to our being to seek and seek out the best Jamaican cu cuisine whenever you move to a place. So, <laughs> so if you want to know where Jamaican food is, yes, you ask me and I, I can point you in some really good directions. So, uh, Rasan, you then ended up going to university um, right here in Maryland, eventually uh, Bowie State, getting your MBA, healthcare management and uh, MBA. Why study healthcare management and business? What aspirations did you have back then about your career? Yeah, it's interesting because that, that whole... Uh, scholastic apparatus that is that was my life is it, it came through a really interesting um experience so you know let's let's bring it back so i'm a, I'm, a, I'm a jamaican that that came to america my mom is is at, at the time probably 41 42 years old she knows nothing about the education system here in america we come i go to high school and i apply to literally one college one university <laughs> um, and, and the reason why I applied to one university is because my guidance counselor, I, I attended a high school, Eleanor Roosevelt High School in Greenbelt, Maryland. My guidance counselor had me apply for what was the Meyerhoff Scholarship because I was in the National Honor Society. I was in the Talented and Gifted program. And she said, you would, you would, you would do beautifully if you apply. Literally, I applied to one school and got into the school. And so the University of Maryland was a school that... So, so unlike this, you know, this kind of context where people do a common application and apply to 75 schools, or they have a plan of breaking their schools from Ivy to state schools to whatever, Rasan Bernard did none of that. <laughs> and in fact, the whole MBA thing came um, and uh, I was told at, by a friend of mine that I should have applied, you know, there's several schools that were, were great business schools. And for me, as the young Jamaican, I was thinking about money. So even though I got into, you know, the University of Maryland um, uh, business school, their, the cost of school was three times the amount at Bowie State. And so I, 
for me who wanted to go in business, I was like, this makes more sense. And so, you know, when I tell people that story, it's, it's a very different, it's an unconventional path um, for most people in the, in the, in, in the States, because people get to, anyway, so, so how, so why healthcare and why, and why business? Well, one, um, the University of Maryland, Baltimore County had one of the most, I think, rigorous health informatics program at the time that I was attending. And they, um, they're known for their honors college uh, uh, disposition, and they're known for, um, really strong engineers um, uh, and research. And so uh, it, was, it was kind of a natural fit for me when I went to the school and saw uh, the opportunities that healthcare informatics, to, one, this sounded really neat. Two, I was really, I really loved the idea of, of, you know, uh, of health and health management, that was one. And then two, to understand how technology can support that was just something that was very, um, interesting to me. So anyway, so I chose it because of those things, but I also wanted to understand how this can be monetized in a way that not only support organizations and individuals, but if I wanted to start a business, how could this be, how could the value proposition of, of putting healthcare technology and business together lead me to become someone successful or someone who's desirous of becoming successful? So those are the reasons why I chose that path and it's, it's been wonderful. It's been absolutely wonderful. Yeah, I mean, there are interesting fields and I'm just curious, anyone that uh, knows you as the opportunity to see Rasan knows you are very fit. You exercise quite a bit. You've done bodybuilding. So what was it that got you so specifically interested in exercise fitness which then also you wanted to marry with the studying of healthcare management and business. And, you know, it started out at 12 years old, Mahan, standing behind a fence in Jamaica and watching a neighbor of mine who was an extremely fit guy do pull-ups on, on, on some kind of apparatus he created. And I was... I knew him because he was my neighbor, who was an older guy, but I was just fascinated by his fitness level, his diligence, um, the look he had, the confidence he exuded. And I, I was desirous of all of that. Plus at the time I played sports, so I played soccer. And so I was already involved in athletics, but I did not look like this guy. And so, that really was the first trigger. And from that point onward, it was an exploration and an adventure for me to get to a place where I could emulate what this guy to me represented. And so one thing led to another. So that led to high school sports, high school sports led to collegiate sports. And all the while being in a context, being in the sports context also placed me in the gym. And so being in the gym, um, one thing led to another. So I started to really try out different things with my body, hence the bodybuilding, right? It was a, it's a whole different um, uh, 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 discipline and, and it's a lot more rigor uh, with diet and exercise. And so I, I explored that for, for a period of time. And then, yeah, so all of those things were additive and all those things in aggregation led me to this desire to study more about health and health management obviously going to UMBC and seeing that there's a health management slash informatics. I took that desires to own my own business is the reason why I did business. And when you add it all up, that sum is where I am today. Yeah. And so you also uh, took that and started a, a business in uh, health management with your new wife, uh, uh, the least that uh, it takes, it takes a lot of uh, guts for people to go in business with their spouses. So what's the story of you wanting to start that business and have your wife as your partner? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. So let me just make sure in, in the spirit of full disclosure, I married up. I married way up. <laughs> My wife is brilliant. Um, she is the <laughs> smartest woman I know. 
Um, and she, R- Rasan, I've I have met her. I agree with you. You did, but we are we are both very fortunate that way. So um, I, I have to agree uh, with you, my friend. <laughs> yes. No. So so the, so I met my wife 19 years ago, and and the two years prior to actually being married, we discussed many things. But one of the things we discussed more specifically was business. Her dad. Uh, was an entrepreneur. She grew up in an entrepreneurial family. I had big desire to own my own business, as I mentioned to you before, throughout college and 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 and, and post college, and that was something that we just really clicked on. And so we spoke business for pretty much two years. I mean, not not as a as as a as a kind of structured <laughs> thing, but but just as this desire to have a family business. And so when we got married. Um, we decided she was in a place where she was ready to leave her job. I was in a place where I was ready to leave my job. And, and what we did was really staggered how we did it. So she left her job first. We lived on one income because we went from two incomes to one income. And then I left my job and we, were, we had no income besides this business idea. And one thing led to another thing. And we landed our first contract with Amerigroup. Group. And then our second contract came with the Federal Reserve Bank and then another contract. So it was just building on these building blocks. And um, here we are 17 years later. I'm no longer involved in the day-to-day of that business, but the business is running and has weathered the storms of COVID. Uh, And my wife, uh, after our first child was born, uh, she left the business and started really to do the business of homeschooling. So she's been homeschooling our kids um, for the last, you know, 15 years. My son this year will, will leave the house to go to conventional high school, he'll he'll attend um, St. John's here in Washington, but he's the first really to go to a conventional private high school. Yeah, so uh, that business, as you said, uh, has thrived over the years, including over a COVID uh, time period, which has been very hard for a lot of business, especially anything to do with healthcare management. Now, then what was it that got you to uh, look into and become uh, the president of building bridges across the river, Rasan. You know, I would say for me, from a very early age, I I knew I I had a desire to serve in a capacity that that placed the people who were the most in need or people who were the most left behind in the center of my work. Like I've, there's always been this magnetic pull to lead in this context. And I think having the opportunity to show up and having the relationships to support that opportunity is the reason why I'm at Building Bridges Across the River. And what I mean by that is, you know, after meeting Skip McMahon and after meeting uh, Chris Smith, who were both co-founders of Building Bridges Across the River, and after studying what they had contributed to this community and 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 just their hearts, their desires, um, I wanted it to be I wanted to be a part of that story. Um, and so, really, m- my own desires of of being a leader in this context, coupled with what they had already set in motion was just, to me, a no-brainer. So, Rasan, what is this story? What is Building Bridges Across the River? Yeah, so Building Bridges Across the River is a Ward 8 nonprofit whose primary purpose is to reduce the barriers to social and economic mobility for residents east of the river. And if you are a Washingtonian, or if you are someone who lives in Washington but not necessarily born here, it's very evident just by the four quadrants of the city and by basically the east and knowing the east and west side of the city to understand that 900 feet of water, which is the Anacostia River, really separates the city in, in many, many ways, economically, um, medically, um, uh, socioeconomically, um, in the context of even, even food deserts, there are more food deserts on our side of the, of the river. Um, there are more opportunities um, for, for debilitating disease. I mean, there's a study out today that, that says folks east of the river live 13 less years than folks west of the river. 
Um, housing prices, uh, due to redlining over the many, many years, are lower here at this side of the river. It's four times higher um, in many places on the west side of the river. So, so the east, east of the river families have been left out a lot of the converse, left out of conversation a lot, and 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 it has been under resourced for many, many years. And so, so Rasan, let, let me let me interrupt you there for a second because I sure. think it's important for us to put it in context. Sure. Why why is that? Why has the eastern part of DC uh, been neglected over generations? Why has the eastern side of the city, most specifically east of Anacostia River, had had such issues? as you say, food deserts, uh, medical deserts. I mean, you you name it, it's there. Why is that? What are the historical factors and roots of this? That's a great question. So th there are confluence of issues, but at the root of it, much of it has to do with race. And so when you look systemically at history, what you've seen, so, so, so just based on that question alone, Demographically, 92%, upper 90% of the city, of the city's black and brown population lives east of the Anacostia River, okay? And so over the last 30 years, even before that, the types of investments that would come this side of the river were stymied because of, of, of race. Um, people didn't want to invest in this side of the river. Um, schools that are on this side of the river were not performing at the results of schools on the west side of the river. And so because there was a lack of investment due to race, there was also a lack of investment in, in the assets that are here. So redlining, for example, was a big reason why many dollars from banks weren't flowing readily uh, east of the river. And to know to have kind of a socio-ecological understanding of uh, this kind of context, we know when there's a concentration of poverty, there's a concentration of a lot of maladies like crime, right? Um, uh, a lack of health care because doctors and physicians and institutions don't want to come across the river to invest here. There's a lack of grocery store, uh, uh, healthy food. So we have one grocery store until recently for 80,000 residents. So it goes on and on and on and on. But to answer your question more specifically, systemically, it was because of race. Yeah, so that that is why it's important to, to have an organization like Building Bridges Across the River. Just want people to understand it in that we have listeners uh, across the globe now in uh, 100 countries. But even I find people that have been... Uh, uh, Washingtonians for many years, born and raised in this region, don't understand why there are these differences in different parts of the city, and therefore what initiates the need for a mission-based organization like building bridges across the river. Yes, and I, I would say this, Mahan, you know, our co-founders, Chris Smith and Skip McMahon, before the word equity became sexy, they were doing equity work in bringing building bridges across the river here, east of the river, providing the best in class in facilities, programs, and partnerships for the folks who deserved it, but were never invested in. And so this work has been going on now for, for, for 17 years, uh, actually 2005, yes, yeah, 17 years. And now that the word equity is sexy, um, people have looked to our work to, to learn from us and to learn how we, we, we did this. But really the reality was they took an opportunity and I would say a risky one at that to invest in a community at the time when no one was investing. And what we have today are metaphorical bridges that have been built with the community in a way that have force multiplied our progress. Um, we have young people who have been here, gone to school here, got their healthcare here and are now doing amazing things. Um, people who have never been exposed to dance and arts and culture um, have gotten an opportunity to be exposed here. And so it's, it's unbelievable what has happened over the last 17 years. And I look forward to 
what will happen the next seven, 10, 15 years from now. So you already touched on some of those, uh, Rasan. What are the services that Building Bridges Across the River provides to the residents? So Building Bridges Across the River really has five signature projects. I call them our value proposition to the community. Um, our first project really is a humanitarian mall of sorts. We aggregate on one campus, 16 and a half acres, 203,000 square feet of programming space, 14 nonprofits that serve in five sectors, health, education, arts, recreation, and workforce development. So one person, anybody living in these neighboring communities can step on our campus and have a one-stop shop for healthcare, for education, for workforce development, for arts, for culture. And so really what we provide is an easy pass to not only excellence, but opportunity. And so we have been bridging communities and building opportunities with the ARC for 17 years. In addition to that, we, because this place is a food desert, we have a farm that's about an acre, acre and a half, and seven other urban farms networked around east of the river communities, specifically Ward 8, that feed our residents. So we aggregate our produce and we distribute that produce through our CSA, which is a community supported agriculture. And people get produce for low cost, organic produce from our organization on a weekly basis right here on our doorsteps. We also provide a standalone workforce center. That center is called the Skyland Workforce Center. We provide workforce training in, in construction, retail, allied health. Uh, we certify folks uh, 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 with CPR and first aid who are doing, um, uh, who require certification for their jobs. We help with, with resume writing. We put people in jobs. And that standalone center is on Naylor Road uh, located in Ward 8. It's right across from the Skyland development. Importantly, we have the largest theater east of the Anacostia River. If you want to know how a society is doing, just scan their arts and culture. And we have a platform here, our Presidium Theater, seats 365. The stage is as deep and wide as the, as the Eisenhower Theater at the Kennedy Center. And we've created a platform for artists in this community to have a, play to a, a place to express their gifts and talents and abilities, a place that they never had before. And we've paired that with a black box theater, a smaller theater, so that the artists who need smaller spaces can use that at their own behest in this community. So we provide an arts and culture space for our community. And so those, those things in aggregate is the genius of building bridges across a river. What's coming and we are excited about is the physical bridge that we will build. So over the last 17 years, we've built these metaphorical bridges. In 2025, we will build the first elevated bridge park in the nation's capital that will actually connect this physical edifice that really it's the size of about three football fields put end to end to end. This physical edifice will connect the two areas that are separated by that 900 feet of water I, I aforementioned, this is the Anacosta River. So we are actually building a connection point known as the 11th Street Bridge Park to connect those communities so that now our neighbors can walk across, literally walk across to connect with each other. And that's to come. So we're really, really excited about that. That's a $139 million project and we're already 92% there. That will be a magnificent way, as you said, to connect the people the con and connect the communities building on the wonderful services you have been providing, Rasan. Now, one of the things I wonder is what can uh, the community do or what are some of the conversations you all have at Building Bridges Across the River to ensure that the residents, when the actual bridge is built, in addition to the metaphorical bridges, the residents can continue to afford to live in the neighborhood in that there are parts of uh, DC where I love seeing the beautiful developments and everything else that has happened. But I remember as a teenager, 
yes. going to some of those parts and there were rich communities there that no longer exist. Yes. So I wonder in the back of my mind, what happened to those people? I'm sure yes. they are not the ones inhabiting the minute million and a half dollar, $2 million condos. So as you're building this physical bridge, what are the conversations around and what are you doing to make sure that it is the residents that benefit from it rather than quickly get outpriced and pushed out to another part of the city through Prince George's County or out of the region? Yeah, that's a great question. And that answer resides in our approach. So we have been building this bridge, this physical bridge, not the metaphorical ones I mentioned, over the last 10 years. So its manifestation, the physical edifice, its manifestation is earnest, right? So it's, it's to come. But the actual bridge, the actual, the details of that bridge, its design, um, its structure, its uses, all of those things have been community driven from the very beginning. In fact, the design of the bridge itself started out with community meetings. We've done about a thousand of those right now, um, where we have, we have literally empowered the community to be agents of their own change. So, so this community driven project received national recognition for its equitable development plan. So prior to us even talking about getting a contractor to put one brick atop another brick, we have been building with our community, their desires, their wishes, and their intentions. And it's been driven by that. And our equitable development plan is proof of that. So let me give you an example. We now have in a one mile walk shed of the bridge, which we believe is the hottest place to be once the bridge gets here, meaning it would, if without intervention, it would be the most gentrified area in the city once it's built, this bridge is built. To know Ward 8 and to know that one mile walk shed is to know that it's littered with renters, not homeowners. And so what we have done is partnered with Mana Housing to ensure that renters who have been here for generations get the opportunity to purchase the home that they're living in. And how have we done that? We started a home buyers club. That home buyers club today have more than 102 homeowners who were once renters in that one mile walk shed. So now let's think about that. You are now a owner of a home. You're one of 102 people that were renting and would have been displaced when this bridge gets here. Now you own your home and you can really experience the yield that is to come with the rising tide that is to come. And that's just one of many strategies. We've also partnered with organizations like JP Morgan Chase and others who've invested in our equitable development plan to shore up small businesses, provide microloans for small businesses, to provide technical assistance for small businesses. Um, we also have um, a community land trust that we've set up that purchased land to, 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 to hold in perpetuity so that people who desire to live in place and thrive in place can, can live and thrive in place on that land. And that land trust, though it's not run by us, will is a, it's a nonprofit organization that will hold that land into perpetuity so that development doesn't come and, and, and really chase or move residents out of that place. So we that our strategy, it has there's about 34 strategic points. Um, I, I can, you know, we won't, I won't spend this time going through all 34 strategies, but the idea is that our strategic plan of the e equitable development plan um, has led us to believe that we, yes, it's not the silver bullet to gentrification, um, but if we're gonna do development, this is the way you do development that's thoughtful, that's community led, community driven, um, and community changing in, in a positive way. I love the approach you've taken, Rasan, as you said, engaging the community ahead of time and considering the impact on the community all throughout and making sure that the longtime residents of the community benefit and get a chance to participate rather than get displaced. This is a great approach to thinking about inclusive and equitable development, improving our spaces for everyone's benefit, 
but enabling the residents lifelong and in many instances generational residents to stay part of that community and keep the community uh, thriving the way it should. So I love the approach that you have taken to this and look forward to the physical bridge when it's done because that, as you said, will be the culmination of all of this community engagement and involvement and the many metaphorical bridges that you have built in supporting the community. Yes, indeed. And, and, I, would, and I would say one of the pieces of this that I think is a, is a standout element uh, of our equitable development plan are the cultural strategies that we have put in place to ensure that that sense of belonging. You know, Mahan, one of the things I love about Jamaica is that when I go back to Jamaica, it's topography, it's culture, it's reggae, it, the food, the people, it has stasis. It hasn't changed. It hasn't morphed into something that's unrecognizable. Money hasn't poured into it and that's changed its disposition. It's Jamaica. You get off the plane and you say, ah, oh, I am home. We desire the same thing for the residents east of the Anacostia River. Their, our cultural strategies, our goal with those strategies is, is to ensure that they feel belonging in their neighborhoods despite the money that's being poured into it. And so we look forward to the day where someone can get off and you know, get off the plane from a visit to another country, come back to Anacostia and say, oh man, I am home. <laughs> I mean, it looks the same, it feels the same. Uh, you know, so, so anyway, so, so those are some of the things that we're really, really proud about and, and our national recognition for that. We're a member of the Highline Network, um, which is a, a, a group of folks who are doing the same kinds of projects, um, uh, rebuilt infrastructure uh, projects throughout the country to support communities. And, um, and, and, our and our project has been highlighted by the Highline Network as kind of the best in class approach on how to do this on how to build and, and, and invest in communities. That's outstanding and a lot to celebrate with that, Rasan. There's also uh, a, a lot of celebration with respect to you having joined National Board of Feeding America. What yes. is Feeding America about and what do you look to contribute through that board involvement? Yeah, so Feeding America is a, is a national organization. Um, it is uh, really, the national office um, represents 200 food banks across the country uh, with the goal of ending hunger in America. Uh, that's really the, the goal, to end hunger in America, um, to have no person in America go hungry. And so um, it's, 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 for me, it is an, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful organization because I get, a I get a national lens of what's happening across the country as it relates to food insecurity. Uh, and I get to opine and also share in strategies to help people across all of America uh, become more food secure. And so um, for me, it, it just gives me an opportunity to, to, to think strategically and bring that strategic thinking locally, uh, as I'm also a member of the, of the Capital Area Food Bank, um, and to see how those, how those national strategies, once distilled, how they can impact local communities like ours. And so it's really been a wonderful experience for me uh, being on that board. Yeah, and uh, Rasan, one of the things I love with respect to what you've done with building bridges across the river and is really important to keep in mind with respect to leadership is that for quite a while, partly because of the industrial age view of organizations and leadership, leadership was very much top down where uh, a senior executive or group of senior executives would think what's the right thing for the organization, roll it on down. And that's also the way we approached as a country and in many countries, the communities where a group of people would go sit in a room and decide what they thought was yeah. best for the community and implemented it. How you have been approaching building bridges across the river is the way leaders of all kinds of organizations, not just community-based organizations, should think about leadership, which is 
it is through the engagement, through the participation and the active involvement of the people that you build up the strategy, not a strategy that is decided on high on top and then cascaded down down to everyone else in the organization. Yes, I, I look, I couldn't agree with you more. I, you know, I think um, what I've learned about leadership in, in that regard is that it is it is it is tantamount if it's not defined as service. And that service looks many different ways to your point. It's it's the service of empowerment. It's the service of 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 deep listening. Um, it's the service of motivating ideas. It's the service of facilitating those ideas. Um, it's the service of, at times, acquiescing to the ideas that are brought to the table. And so I agree. I think that there is there's that, you know, the, the type of leadership that I currently operate in is, is that servant leadership. Absolutely. And so uh, in addition to... Uh, again, your own leadership, Rasan, you have uh, focused a lot on doing the right things in the right way with the community. Are there any leadership resources, practices that you typically find yourself referring to uh, uh, that you recommend to others or ones that have been impactful to your thinking? Because again, when I, when I look at how you have approached building bridges across the river, it's exactly what I tell clients and try to convince organizations in that that top down thinking doesn't work. Yes. Now, it doesn't work in the community. It doesn't work in small organizations. It doesn't work in large organizations. Yes. Yes. So what has informed your leadership and what do you recommend when it comes to leadership practices, resources, in order for people to lead more the way you have at building bridges across the river? You know, I, I you know, there is, um, there are several resources, you know, um, Warren Bennis has a book on becoming a leader that I think, I think is a great primer for anyone understanding leadership and what it does Mahan, it is, it, it goes through um, everything you just said, you know, the, the things that leaders contemplate uh, that the things, the things that leaders contemplate that debilitate them, meaning, do, you know, should I, should I put the agenda forward? Should I be the one? Um, it really talks a lot about um, uh, thinking through and listening to the audience that you have at hand. Um, it, it, it in many ways puts uh, the people that you're working with, the people that you're leading with, putting them on the stage and allowing them uh, to be empowered and to generate ideas as you, as the really almost like the conductor, orchestrate um, a symphony with all of their gifts and talents. Uh, it also, you know, I've spent a lot of time reading books by Pat Lencioni. Um, I think he's done a really good job with his leadership books. Um, the five dysfunctions of a team is one of those that I think every leader should understand when putting a team together, understanding the context um, of, 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 of what debilitates a team, um, I think is also very, very helpful. You know, I spend a lot of time doing reflection, introspection, um, and, and writing those introspections and reflections down to, to get, to get insight in who I am. And so I would say a lot of leadership is knowing thyself. Um, you know, a lot of leaders get in their own way. And I think it's because they don't know themselves enough uh, to deploy their talents, gifts, and abilities. And, and I would say, as I said to you before, leadership is tantamount to service. If you're not serving, you're not leading. Um, and, and a leader um, really is a leader when people who do not have the obligation to follow, follow. You know, so, you know, if you're leading and, and, and people are following you and they have no obligation to follow you, uh, you're doing something right. And I think that the ingredients for that um, is servitude, uh, it's deep listening. Um, it's it's counting others really more highly than you count yourself as it relates to your own disposition, your your thoughts, your ideas, and it's fostering a community where people feel safe um, to share ideas uh, because they know that they belong and that they're going to be empowered and motivated to act on things that are they're convicted about. So so all of those things are 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 are, are uh, things that for me over the years have helped shaped 
um, uh, my leadership thinking. Um, and I would suggest, you know, those are small things, little things, but I would suggest those things to any other leader taking part. The last thing I would say is this, leadership requires imprinting. And what I mean by that is leadership requires a modeling of really strong leaders. So a leader who can spend time with other leaders, um, like our Leadership Greater Washington network of leaders, being around other leaders to allow that imprinting to take place and that learning to take place, I think is extremely efficacious to any leader that wants to get um, uh, their, their, their leadership skills and abilities sharpened. Oh, I love the uh, recommendations, the resources, the perspectives, the, impr the imprinting that you mentioned, Rasan, is really important. The, uh, the reducing of our blind spots in that getting to know ourselves yes. is one of the things that I find becomes harder as we move up in yes. organizations. As we move up in experience, sometimes we tend to become more convinced of our own yes. uh, knowledge, our own experience and success. Yes. So getting to know ourselves deeply is important and i love the way you put it that leadership is getting people that don't have to follow you to want to follow you and i've had uh, conversations with some uh, great authors uh, uh, from greg Sattel on where they talk about movement thinking and the fact that when you think about it people follow movements because of a belief not because they're being paid Yes. This is not to say that uh, organizations shouldn't pay their employees. However, no. the uh, employees or the people that work for you shouldn't just want to follow you only because they are getting paid. There is a desire to contribute. So those are great recommendations on the leadership front. But you know, I can't leave you with just recommendations on the leadership front. Being that you mentioned the pride in Jamaican cuisine, yes, fine wine. So the question, at least for the people in the greater Washington, D.C. region yes. and those planning to visit the greater Washington, D.C. region is the best places to hit to get great, authentic Jamaican cuisine, other than your house, which I'm sure you're inviting yes. all listeners and me to. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely my house. Um, <laughs> there are several places. I mean, you know, you know, got to give my, 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 my folks here in, in the Southeast Quadrant a shout out. Um, Rick's Cafe, that's right here on Naylor Road, is terrific. Um, he's an authentic Jamaican, um, uh, Rick and I, Whenever I go to his spot, we're always exchanging patois. So it's, it, you know, you can come and hear some authentic Jamaican conversation going. The food is, the food is incredible. Um, so I would absolutely recommend that. There's a place called the Jerk Pit um, that is in College Park, uh, another great Jamaican family. Um, they moved and migrated here and they are, they, their apparatus is like, I think they live above where, they, where, they, where the restaurant is. Um, yeah, so that's, I mean, you know, I'm going to offer all those two out there. You go check those two out um, and, and, and let me know what you think. Um, and, 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 you know, again, I love refined wine. I love to get out there on the links and play golf. And, and, um, and you know, my, my, I'm still relentlessly consistent with being in the gym. Well, you are with that as you have been consistently a great leader at uh, building bridges across the river, making a difference, Rasan. Consistently, one of the people that has a sunny, optimistic, positive attitude in every single one of my interactions with you, <laughs> you help elevate my mood and my feelings with your genuinely sincere, warm smile. And that sincerity, that depth of character has a big impact on leadership also. So I really appreciate uh, you sharing your leadership journey, the impact you've been having at building bridges across the river, the resources, and most especially your modeling example. Really appreciate you, Rasan Bernard. Oh, Mahan, my pleasure to be with you today. And thank you for all those kind words. You are way too kind and you lift my spirit. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing that we reciprocate. 
And I think that I believe, at, you know, iron sharpening iron. I, I just love being around you too. So I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Thank you, my friend.